Hello everybody out there. My name is Jason Norton. I'm the pastor here at King's Trail Cowboy Church and I'm actually excited to do this little intro to the sermon um, because it's always a, a good thing to get your mind right and to get settled before you hear God's Word. And speaking of God's Word, I have a scripture for you. It's in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. It says, Come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So when Jesus said, will you come to me and find rest, he also said for you and I to learn from him. So in this sermon section, I pray that you learn the words of Jesus. I pray that you learn the word of God. And um, as you're listening, just remember that this is God's word, and his promise to you is, Faith come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So enjoy the message. Um, I pray it blesses you, and not just you, but everything in your life. And uh, we'll see you at the end. Love you. Bye-bye. Good morning. How are y'all? How about we pray first? Father, um, I thank you for our lives. I thank you, Lord, for Calvary. Lord, the transition from sitting and praising you to standing and preaching. I need your help, Lord. Uh, Lord, I thank you that it's okay to admit when I'm nervous. I thank you, Jesus, uh, for exposing at the core of the flesh we are cowards, but in your presence we can be bold. Amen. So, Lord, I ask for your Holy Spirit to help me walk through this, teach me why I teach, preach to me why I preach, encourage me as I encourage others. And, Lord, may your word go forth, because when your word go forth, you said it never returns void. Uh, so, Lord Jesus, uh, uh, Lord, I thank you that we come to you as children, too. You said, come to me like a child. So I'll just say a little P.S. to this, to this prayer to you. Uh, Lord, you said in your word that after the word is planted, the enemy immediately comes to try to steal that which was planted, lest they be saved. So, Lord, I ask... We all ask those in Christ Jesus that you would ambush the ambusher and that when he comes to try to steal, kill, and destroy, and when he gets excited and licks his lips as if he's about to devour us, that he runs into the Ancient of Days. And uh, Lord, that would sure make us giggle. So Lord, we thank you for that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Isn't it? Isn't it fun just to pour out your heart to the Lord? Yeah. Sometimes that my heart says, Lord, would you just whoop the dog mess out of the enemy, please? Um, well, um, y'all know if you've been coming here a while that sometimes the Lord gives me props to help understand better. Um, I'm a visual learner. Uh, I learn mostly by visual or if you give me the hammer and let me hammer. Um, I'm not the one that can read a book and learn it all by itself. I need to put my hands to it. And uh, so this morning I found out I was reminded that at age 43, getting up at uh, 3 in the morning and walking to church with a backpack on, um, I, I realized that at 43 you can still get kind of nervous of the dark. No real man in here would like to admit that, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Um, sometimes I think my beard is just for looks. <laughs> because I was walking, I was about, I don't know, a mile and a half into the walk, and I'm was like zoned out, I'm just like this. And something, <laughs> something in the bushes took off running. <laughs> and I think it, I'd like to say that I went, but I did some very disgustingly girly, and I was like, ah! <laughs> and then right when I did that, 
I had this, this manhood issue going on. I was like, get a hold of yourself. You're 43 years old, but then I started walking like this <laughs> with my flashlight. Like, Isn't that dumb, but that's what I did? I was like, you were, what's wrong with you? But how many of you know the Lord will talk to you and show you stuff when you do stuff? You know, he, he didn't just say ask. He also said seek and knock. He also said um, don't be a hearer of the word only, but be also a doer. At least you deceive yourself. And I believe that when we, when we do stuff, when we do what the word says, uh, that it will start to expose um, some things in our life that is either trash talk or some stuff that we think works. It's real good in theory, but when you start putting boots on the ground, things change. If you believe that, say amen. amen. So I know y'all see a backpack, um, but I want y'all to think about um, this message today is called Inner Pack. You know, I'm carrying a lot of stuff up here, and you know that after a while you carry certain stuff, you find out what you don't need. I was talking to a, a, a hiker after the first service, and he said it was real funny about the message is that after he, him and a buddy uh, there's, uh, did their first leg of this really long trail, I forgot the name of it, it wasn't the Appalachian Trail, it's the one on the west coast, what's PCT, it's like 3,000 miles um, hiking trail, is that um, he said after the first leg they dumped literally like 30 something pounds because they saw what you need and what you really don't need. What sounded good at home, in the living room, but then again, what you don't need. And that really spoke to me, because that's what we do. You know, you might see a backpack, but this is called inner pack. So as I pull out things out of this backpack, I want you to start thinking about your own walk with the Lord. I want you to start thinking about what are you carrying around? Is it useless weight? Or is it essentials? The way we would describe it in the military or law enforcement is you have essentials and non-essentials, and you had to make sure you didn't leave the barracks with, uh, not, uh, with essentials. You need your essentials, amen? Water, food, stuff to take care of your feet. And uh, real quick, I need a volunteer. If you would uh, read out of the Bible for me, I'll get you the microphone. <clears throat> you want to read for us? I can tell you are not a shy man. Praise the Lord. All right, 2 Timothy. Um, oh, you're using my Bible. I was like, man, that Bible looked like my Bible. <laughs> you grab my Bible. They're both one and the same. Yes. There, I had it marked for you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Thank you, sir. What's your name? Jordan. Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Amen. But evil men, evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and be assured of knowing from who you have learned them, Jesus, thank you. And that from childhood, <laughs> you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. <laughs> which one did you stop at? Go one more. Okay. Yeah. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, amen to that, amen. for correction, thank you, Jesus, for instruction in righteousness, 
I just want to say thank you for You're having welcome. the mending fences open. Amen. I really appreciate thank what God is doing through this church. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, man. Thank you. Okay. You ever, I know you've heard this scripture before, that the man of God may be fully equipped. You ever really dissected that? Equipped. What are you carrying around with you? Um, and are you equipped to handle uh, what will be presented to you? Amen. Um, many people over the last 10 years of, um, of my life have asked me, how do you, or how do I, or how can I, uh, fill in the blank many questions. And uh, many times, and I don't think people do this on purpose, but it's many times as if, just tell me uh, what to do, and then it'll all get better, right? Right, preacher? Just tell me what to do, and then it'll all get better. But no, um, it's really not just one answer. It can be one answer, but you would not like my answer. Because the answer is always more Jesus, more presence of God. And you say, no, I could ask you a specific question, and I bet you the answer is not Jesus. It doesn't matter what you ask me, the answer can be Jesus, because all the mysteries and wisdom of God is hidden in Jesus. So if you're seeking out wisdom or any answers to anything, more Jesus let me prove it. Any question you have, could Jesus answer it? Yeah, yeah. So if he can answer it, then the answer is always more Jesus. But people don't like that answer. I wouldn't like that answer too, especially if I'm having a little panic moment and I need some help. Um, so people want specifics. So that's when I started seeing this backpack and I started seeing us carrying around stuff. And um, so today's not going to be your you know, I was kind of arguing with the Lord. Nobody in here ever does that, right? But I was kind of arguing with the Lord because I was like, well, it'll be kind of scatterbrained. The message will be kind of here and then over there, and then it won't flow right, right? How I many you know that's religion? And sometimes it's not going to flow right. Why? Because life just kind of will throw a speed bump in there, a hiccup, uh, just, you know, everything's going good, and then all of a sudden, before lunch, it all goes bad. So sometimes one thing ain't just going to cut it all day long, and it's what we're carrying. Uh, the very first thing the Lord showed me was um, I, I put my Bible in last up here at the top so I could pull it out first. And the, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, you cannot pull it out if you didn't put it in. That by itself should preach to us the rest of our lives. The only way that the Holy Spirit can bring back to your remembrance is if, is if, if first it is put inside you. Amen. Amen. The scriptures, I hide thy word in my heart so that I may not sin against thee. And as you um, go through life, the Holy Spirit, he says, my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. So Holy Spirit will speak to you and he'll speak to you in scripture. Amen. He'll speak to you in, in simple ways. So, but how can he speak to you, bring back to your remembrance if it's not put in there in the first place? He can because nothing is impossible for God, but how do you know it's him? How do you know it's not you or somebody else? Amen. How do you know if somebody's giving you, how do you know if the man is standing in front of you right now speaking truth? The book of Acts said that after they heard the word of God being preached, they went back and they studied and made sure that what they were told was the truth. Amen. So how do we know that unless we first put it in? So that's why I do daily readings. That's why we get in this word every day. You know, to me, right off the bat, where the Lord convicted my heart, being a former soldier, is this. If this is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, it is the final piece of God's armor that he speaks about in Ephesians 6. And he says, and then, then 2 Timothy talks about being a soldier of Christ. He said, soldiers are not ever caught without their weapon. And a good soldier would know how to manipulate their weapon. I don't mean manipulate as in how we would think it, but know how to handle it. Handle it when it's working good. Handle it when it's dirty. Handle it when it's malfunctioning. Know how to handle it. You sleep with it. You eat with it. You walk with it. You talk with it. You learn how to be with it. A soldier's never caught without his weapon. And so that's how the Lord really related it to me and how I need to know this. It's not just a thick book. It's not just something that, oh, I don't want to read that, I don't understand it, I get discouraged. Well, read it until you do understand it. 
Amen? Because there will come a time that he says, it was, my brother Jordan even read it. He said, people, men will go, grow more evil and more evil, deceiving and mo making more deception. The very, the very first response to Jesus when the disciples who walked with him three years, they said, Lord, would you explain to us these end times? The very first thing that was out of his mouth is he said, let no one deceive you. How many know that means a preacher? How many know that means a church? How many know that means the media, the, all of it? Anything that tastes, that touches your ears, you need to make sure that you know the Word of God. It's not legalism. It's knowing your sword as a soldier. So the very first thing that I learned is that this needs to be in my backpack. This needs to be in my inner pack. Amen. So it can bubble up and he can use the Word of God um, when I'm praying for somebody. Use the Word of God when I'm... I'm sitting there, literally, me and my dad experienced this yesterday, yesterday. Don't want to get into a long spiel, but he's a lot smarter than I am when it comes to this, but we got a zero-turn mower. How many know you crawl under one of those things? You kind of better know what you're doing, or you'll make it worse, right? Uh-oh, is that a word of knowledge for somebody right there? Okay. So we're sitting there, and our normal response, I'll just say me. I don't know about my dad. My normal response is load it up in the trailer. We'll take it. They'll get it fixed. I know it's going to be like $120 an hour labor, but you know what? Don't care. we got to mow, or it looked look like, you know, we ain't mowing at all. How many know that, man, can I, can I speak real in church? <laughs> mowing the lawn around here can get discouraging. You mow, and three days later, it looked like you cooking meth. <laughs> and I swear up and down, we just mowed. I promise, we were not, we mowed. <coughs> so we're kind of panicking. If we don't get this mower fixed, it's going to be bad, yeah. right? So we're, our response is just load it up. And we'll go, so anyway, long story short, we're like, no, we've took it back to the barn, and we start just... Like, we're just going to sit here and just slowly, step by step, figure this thing out. And I don't know what my dad was praying, but he had been praying because everything started working right. You know if you work out in the country on a, on a machinery and everything's going right, God is present. Because that stuff just doesn't happen. But the Word of God, any man lacking in wisdom, let him ask, and he'd give liberally without reproach. You know what that means? That is a prayer that if you're a child of God, you can always go to the Lord, and he will always say yes and amen. He will always say yes to his child, to his bride. He'll sit there and say, oh, you want wisdom? Here it is. And not only will he give it, he won't make fun of you. How many of you know that you can go get some wisdom from, for some people, but it's going to cost you? They're going to not only make fun of you, they're going to drive it in the dirt for the next three years of your life. Amen? Jesus said that if any man lacking in wisdom, let him ask him to give liberally. It means he, got, he has all of it. He has all the wisdom. The Holy Spirit's called the spirit of wisdom. And once he gives it, he's not going to make fun of you. So the very first thing that I learned that I needed my backpack or my inner pack is the Word of God. That the man of God would be fully equipped for every good work. This right here, we need to have inside of us. Amen. Okay. And then the other things, is, as we go through this, I just kind of pick some stuff that I normally uh, um, pumps up in my spirit from time to time. Can I have a volunteer, please? Jesse, come here. Come over here on this side, buddy. Everybody say, hey, Jesse. Hey, Jesse. He's seven. That's my boy. Undo those, unfold them, and then lay them out. God bless you. Okay. The very first one. The reason why I put it in these containers is because when we dive off into Scripture, we need to understand you cannot intellectually comprehend and overcome um, trying to grasp the Word of God. Many brilliant people try to understand the Word of God, and they can intellectually kind of talk themselves through a conversation, but there's no way you can take a flesh thing to understand a spiritual thing. Amen. It takes spiritual things to understand spiritual things. That's why you need to be saved by the power of the Holy Spirit and filled with His Spirit. And then you, can, then you can compare spiritual things with spiritual things. So I put it in here because it's a reminder to me in the Gospels on the walk to Emmaus 
where the disciples, two of the disciples are walking with Jesus. They don't even realize they're walking with Jesus. Amen. And that immediately tells me that there's times that somebody can be sent to me. Right? You've done it unto the least of these. You've done it unto me. It goes both ways, right? So there can be literally people sent to me at times, and I don't even realize it, but that was God sent. I didn't even realize it. How many of you know that God loves you so much that he'll send somebody to you just to make you smile? God loves you. Amen? The Bible says he is our greatest. Everybody say greatest. He's our greatest encourager. Amen. Okay. The reason why I put it in here is because it's a reminder to me that at the end of that story it says, and then Jesus opened their eyes to the scriptures. He opened up their understanding to the scriptures. So that's why I'm opening this up as a reminder. So when you, when you go to read the scriptures, you go to study the scriptures, just say a quick little prayer. Lord, open my eyes. That's it. Just open my eyes. Thank you, buddy. You have a seat. So here's the first one. Jordan read it. 2 Timothy 3.16. I bet we could have several people in here that could quote John 3.16, right? Well, this is 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture. Everybody say, all scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I know that in Numbers, in the book of Numbers, Another associated scripture that I would relate to this, I call it an anchor scripture. And then the Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do, or has he spoken and has he not made it good? So that means that everything in that book, all of it is infallible, period, period. Everybody say period. No argument. If you start to argue that, guess what? You can, but welcome to torment. And if you argue on one, then you're going to argue on two and three and four. And then before you know it, you're drifted and you're lost and you're tormented. You don't know what to do. That is the inspired word of God. So if it says it, I believe it. If you believe it, say amen. amen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed. It's not just talking about God's word. It is God's word. Amen. It changes the atmosphere of the room when it is spoken out loud. That's why it says faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible itself declares there's a change. If it's written down, it's Logos. If it's spoken, it's Rhema. The Bible itself declares that once it's read out loud, something just affects change in the room. If you believe that, say amen. In John 14, 26, it said, But the Helper, everybody say, Helper. Amen. Why would God send a Helper? Because we need help. Raise your hand if you need some help. Amen. He said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. If you believe that, say amen. amen. So I know as I go to day to day with my inner pack that God's word promises me that he will do that for me. You, do, you, do you understand that? He promises you he will help you. We're listening. Number two, praise God for babies. Hmm. Hebrews chapter two, if you're a note taker, you can write this down. If you're writing or if you're looking it up, might have to be quick today. Hebrews chapter two, verse one, it says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard least we drift away. And I'll put right there, it challenges me. And I don't know about y'all, but I can speak for myself, is I have to have a challenge. I have to be placed in an environment to where I have to demonstrate I need a most earnest heed, a more earnest heed, or I'm going to start to drift, just as the Bible says. Now let us therefore take the more earnest heed, least we drift have you gotten comfortable in your Christianity? Have you gotten comfortable in your walk? How can you commune and fellowship with a great comforter if you're not willing to get outside your comfort zone? Amen. Falling in love with the furnace. Sometimes God will make you do so, not make you. He'll ask you, draw you, woo you, convince you, encourage you, inspire you to do something uncomfortable. Especially if it's your first time to do something, but it's going to challenge somebody. Amen. 
He's gonna, he, there's at times he's going to get you uncomfortable, wake you up at 3 and tell you to put on a backpack and walk to church. You know what else that, that happened to me while I was walking to church today? I started, I started thinking about all the people in Uganda who walk to church every day. I was part of a leadership meeting in Uganda, and Mbale, to be specific, M-B-A-L-E, Mbale, uh, Uganda, and they were sitting there, and I, I, it's hard to keep up with their accent, but as I was listening to them, I, I leaned over to a minister, I said, Reverend, what are they talking about? They said, Masumba, they are trying to figure out how to have church three times a day. I said, what did you say? He said, Masumba, they are trying to figure out how to have church three times a day. They said, once a day is not enough. Conviction all over the room, <laughs> including this guy. Amen. Three times a day in the morning, they have morning glory. All they do is praise God in the morning. Amen. At the time that I was there. At lunch, they have hour of power. They fast. They don't eat till night. Hour of power. And at night, they have normal Sunday type church. And their praise and worship usually lasts an hour and a half to two hours, and then the word is like ten minutes, and then the ministering is like another hour. Amen. Amen. You go on a mission trip to Uganda, you will be challenged. That's right, Brandy? You'll be challenged. Is Sheila here? Not here today? You'll be challenged. And that's what I love about this is the Holy Spirit reminds me sometimes, are you doing something in such a way? Thank you, Jordan. Are you doing something in such a way that it causes you to be in an environment to survive it? You're going to have to take the more earnest heed, at least you drift. Because I don't know about y'all, but if I'm not in that environment, I will drift. I will be obedient to the other side of that set of scriptures or verse, and I'll start to drift away. Amen. We need a challenge in our life. Number three. Oh, it's quiet. Oh. <laughs> okay. Some, sometimes I read scripture in church and people in the heart go like this. You always say that one. Amen. Amen. Do you ever hear Jesus tell things multiple times? Or behold... Yeah, Ephesians 5.25. Again, this is in my inner pack. This is what's packed in my backpack. You might not have this one. I have this one. But the Holy Spirit brings back to my remembrance. Husbands. Everybody say husbands. husbands. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for her. Amen. You can get up and we go running. We do our day. Take a shower. Get on with the day. Take off. And you might not need that one until... Hmm, 6.20 in the evening. Amen. And he doesn't just tell me to love my wife. He gives me a standard. It says, just as. So you know what that forces me to do? It challenges me to go back to the Gospels. And now, as I'm listening to the Lord teach and preach and heal and cast out demons, now as I'm listening to him, I'm looking at him as a husband loving the church. He's willing to walk for her. He's willing to suffer for her. He's willing to be made fun of for her. He's willing to die for her. Amen. It's not a condemning thing. It's a beautiful reminder. Thank you, Jesus. I was like, Lord, but there'll be like uncomfortable pauses in between all this. Anybody ever had an uncomfortable pause talking to somebody? You're like, I'm trying to be nice, but I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yes. And it's so much easier to be at church when we just talk real. All right. Ladies, wives, mothers, I pray that you... Um, Listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you about the wives and mama scriptures. But this was in my backpack. This is in my inner pack. Mm. Mm. 
in Ephesians 6, 4. I'm crying because I mess this one up all the time. You know, when you see me crying up here, it's not because it's uh, conviction and shame. It's God loving on me when I know I don't deserve it. That's why I cry. It's because I'm sitting there, I'm wondering, why do you do that? You know what he just told me? Just ask. Just ask. The scripture I just read before. Ephesians 6, 4, it says, And you fathers... Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonishing of the Lord. Have you ever read a scripture and you grab the part you really like and you grab the part you're really good at and you kind of gently dismiss the part you're not good at? I'm good at the training part. Half of my life has been around training. You know what training means, whether you like it or not. Like it or not, get up. We're going to do this. Repetition, 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 repetition. I'm good at the training part. But the do not provoke your children to wrath. Sometimes I do that. Here's how you can do that. You have made your point. Now be quiet. But sometimes as daddies... We can make our point and then make our point again and make our point again and make our point again and again. And before you know it, you've broken the child's spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm so thankful that I can be getting onto my children for a good reason. And then in about the second time I open my mouth, the Holy Spirit says, that's enough. He understands you now. Amen. That one, the Lord reminds me of, and I'm thankful. You know, he loves you enough to correct you. Remember 2 Timothy 3.16? Part of that, the reason why the, the word of God is inspired and it equips the man of God for every good work is because one of your good works is to being a daddy. One of your good work, ladies, is being a mama. And he's telling us, you know, once you've made your point, leave it alone. Amen? Kind of like now, the Lord's saying, okay, that's enough, leave it alone. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Number five. <laughs> this one, I love explaining things ex exactly how it happens because you ever have your sock fall down and it bug you? That's what happened. Um, I love explaining things exactly how it happened, and I used to not want to because I didn't want y'all to think I was a weirdo, but now I've just learned that that's just how Holy Spirit speaks sometimes. But I can look across the room at my, at my wife, and in my mind, I can see the Lord writing a check. And then in the mount part, putting a heart. This is the scripture. Let the husbands render to his wife the affection due her. Non-sexual touch. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. So the Bible just told me, I owe that to her. And when I look at my wife and I see a check being written by God in a heart, that's him reminding me I owe her something. I don't owe her money. I owe her love. I owe her love. I, lo I owe her non-sexual contact. Amen. Amen. Ladies, guess what's after that? Comma. <laughs> You're like, you were doing fine. <laughs> Just go to the next part. <laughs> Comma. And likewise. Every wife in here say likewise. likewise. Amen. I'll make sure mine said it. My love language is touch. Hers is last. That's not very funny, Lord. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. Amen. Now, I love putting Scripture together, rightly dividing the Word. How many of you know that 
there's a time to embrace, and there's a time to refrain from embracing. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's a time and season for everything under the sun. Right? So we must apply wisdom also on when to do this. And usually if I see her sad, worn out, tired, distraught, that's when I see the check being written. Amen. And it's something is what I love so much about this is you don't have to do that much. The return is so great. Amen. And that's on both sides. Where I where I really like that, I tell I, me and my wife are very blunt talkers. We'll ask permission to say certain areas because we need to be careful. But I literally said this. Can you put your Bible down, please? Come here. I will say this because I've learned we've been together 16 years, uh, married 13, May 20th. And I'll tell her stuff like this. Hey, when we walk in Chili's, I want you to like, hold on to me. That like makes me feel good as a man. I will be that stupid blunt. And she'll go, oh, okay. <laughs> but when we walk into Chili's, guess what? I'm like, that's my woman. <laughs> right? But guess what that encouraged her to do? It encouraged her to communicate with me that bluntness. Now, how many of us in here, thank you, Mama, how many of us in here would think that and feel that in your heart, but you won't say nothing until you're angry that it's never happening, and now you're going to let it be known? You're like, there's cameras in our living room, honey. Right? We need to communicate this up front early. We need to learn how to be good communicators. And if you don't want to be touched, say that too. Amen? Amen? Because some people do not like it. But you know what that usually means? They've either had a crazy day or they've been hurt in the past and your touch just reminds them of that offender. Amen? We need to apply wisdom there. Where did it go? Hey, I put it there too. <laughs> That's what you do with car keys. Okay, number six. Is this message helping y'all today? Yes. Interpack. Don't forget, as you hear me talk, think about what's in going in your pack. Oh, yeah, this one. This one's powerful. Maybe that's why it's hard to get out. This time, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Many of y'all who read the Bible know where I'm going with this. But sometimes don't try to see where somebody's going with something. Just be in the moment. Amen. And let Holy Spirit speak to you. Because that's what He desires. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a good way to remember that is there's only 13 verses in chapter 13. The subtitle is The Greatest Gift, and it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, it is not puffed up, it does not behave rudely, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, thinks no evil, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. I love this part. Lord Jesus, help me. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Did you hear that, church? You have to be a participant in putting away childish things. The other thing that that tells me as a man is I can be a full-grown man and still being very childish. Amen. Amen. But when I became a man, I, everybody say I. I. I put away childish things. Let Holy Spirit speak to you. For now we see in a mirror dimly. 
but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Amen. So that reminder of me in my inner pack or backpack is I can do all these things. I can get busy. Raise your hand in here if you ever get busy. That your natural, normal response when somebody says, how you doing? What you doing? What you been up to? Oh, man, busy. Busy, 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 busy. The Bible's telling me that I can get very busy, but I need not to forget to love people. I mean, the whole book is a love book. The Bible says God is love. Amen. By this you will know, they will know that you're my disciples for how much you love one another. Love is powerful. Amen. Love never fails. So there's many times that the Lord reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, and I'll be in the midst of something, and he'll go, boom, rewind. Stop. Be quiet. You ain't got to be right. Just love them. Amen. Just love them. And you know, you, is this not real? Is it not true? You can have Holy Spirit prompt you and speak to you to do that. And you know it's him, and you still won't do it. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Okay. You know what you do in that? Just say, in your heart. You don't have to say it out loud. Just say, Lord, help me. Because sometimes you feel like the task in front of you is so daunting, so overwhelming, causes anxiety, etc. Fill in the blank of a negative thing. But you can just say, Lord, that seems too overwhelming. Just tell me what my next step is. You know, sometimes he'll say, get up and just go for a walk. Get up and just walk towards. You know, the Lord was really teaching me, um, it, it continued to teach me and show me how much power the presence of a daddy has. He really brought to my remembrances. He said, look, you don't have to go and raise your voice. Just walk in the room and look at him. Watch. Amen. And it don't have to be one of these. Right? Just walk in the room. Amen. Um, Y'all may have heard this in the past, but I feel led to say it. Um, you know, the Lord will teach you through the simplest ways. And I was watching uh, three cows and a bull in the pasture um, just south of us um, before my mom and stepdad moved there. And there, here comes a big old black Angus bull walking down Bethel Canyon. I was like, well, there's a bull out. Big old boy. He walks right, um, and I didn't realize a bull could jump flat-footed very high. All you cowboys know that. I didn't know that. And he just, like, cleared the fence. Why? Because he saw three cows, and he saw the other bull wasn't as big as him. I'm, I'm guessing that's what he was thinking about. I don't know. The next, the, the next action kind of proves that a little bit. Well, he comes right up, and let's say the, the bull was from here to the wall, Miss Billy. And this other bull that was with these cows just sat there and stared at him. And that, that big bull just went, Bella, what is it called? Huh? Bella, is that a good word? We'll go with it. Anyway, he went, Boo, whatever that is, right? <laughs> and when he did that, the bull just kind of turned around and looked at the cows. And the, the one in the back turned around and walked off. Right? Walked off. Now the big bull starts walking towards him. Stops about halfway, does it again. Woo! Turns around and looks at the cows. These two cows didn't move. They still didn't move. So then the bull turns around and looks at them. The next to the last cow turned around and walked off. I was like, hmm. Maybe bull and cow families are similar to ours. I mean, you know, that you can look at some... And they're going to walk off. You look at another one, they'll sit there and fight with you, right? So the bull starts walking. He's coming. And that, the young bull could tell he's coming. So he turned around and looked at the last cow sitting there. She still didn't move. She just sitting there. And he walked right up to her with his nose and just tapped her flank. Just very little. She turned around and walked off. And believe it or not, that young bull turned around and ended up whooping the big bull. And the big bull went away. What I learned from that, it was like, what does that have to do with church, Jason? As a leader, as a father, as a husband, as a bull, how did that bull, I call it bull leadership, how did that bull handle 
what he was responsible for. The one that came in was hollering. He never hollered. He turned around and looked at one. One walked off. He turned around and, and started to walk towards one. The next one went off. The other one didn't go until he just nudged. And I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that out. And I started trying that out with my children. I have five, four left in the house, and there's one that I can just look at. And she got it. As a matter of fact, she's so smart, she'll go tell the other three, you better leave now. <laughs> right? That's Dakota. Right? And the other ones, I can, we don't have to go through all the lists because one's sitting here listening to me. But anyway, is that you can go, each one needs a different style of leadership, right? And what I was doing, what I was, the Lord was teaching me is I had one leadership, do it or die. Anybody in here got a temper like that? Or you're going to do it, or we're going to make you do it. I had three rules in the house. Ask, tell, make. I'm going to ask you. If you don't do it, I'm going to tell you to do it. And if you don't do it, I'm going to make you do it. How do you know you can't lead a family like that? You lead soldiers. But you ain't going to lead no family. You'll lead them right out of the house, and they'll leave you. Amen. That makes sense. Okay. Here's some other stuff the Lord was showing me. The backpack. Galatians 6, 5, for each one shall bear his own load. That's why I was saying everybody in here has their own backpack. Has anybody in here started seeing what you, what's inside your backpack, your inner pack right now? Right? Okay, this one really got me. Um, let me get these over here. The Lord still speaks to me so much about this. These are like three pounds, you ready, of nothing I mean, they got some sand or something in here. But how much is your wet base the best? 20 pound best. I don't know how much. You, you're used to doing pull ups with them, so you tell me how much that is. I think it's like five. No, it's like two and a half. Okay. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the race of faith. Everybody in here is in a race. Uh, Elder Keith was like, he came in the office this morning, and after I got to church, I just laid on the couch and took a nap. They came in there and prayed over me and stuff, and he picked up the backpack. He goes, I was about to say, did you run to church with that thing? That was impressive. I was like, no, I walked, and I barely got here with the walking. But it's because it had unnecessary weight in it, too. Does this preach to anybody? How much unnecessary weight are you carrying with you in your inner pack? The race of faith. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, let us lay aside every weight. Everybody say every weight. every weight. And the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You imagine right now running a race. How good are you going to race when you're in shorts, T-shirt, and tennis shoes? Or how, much are you gonna, how good are you going to race with jeans, steel toe boots, a jacket, and unnecessary weight on your back. You see, the race of faith is that sometimes we can catch ourselves being so bogged down. How do you know that the weight is heavy? Most of your body language is the, is the same as if you do have something heavy on you. We'll even describe it like that. We'll even say, man, I got something heavy on my mind. Amen. So what is some weight? Matter of fact, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So literally, whatever weight you have, he's wanting you to give it to him. Amen. So here's some weights. Sin. Secret sin can weigh on you. The book of James says, confess these sins to one another and be healed. You need, a, you need an accountability partner at times. I don't need no accountability partner, Jason. I got Jesus. What did Jesus do? He sent them out two by two, so apparently you're really anointed. You don't need anybody. That's a lie from the pits of hell. We all need, hey, last time I checked, we're sheep. Right. Amen. Amen. Sheep need each other. And we all need to get up close and snuggle up with the shepherd. Amen. Okay. So one of the, one of the weights is sin. That if I sit here, y'all listen to this, I'm going to go back. Let's see. Over a decade, I struggle with pornography. When none of, nobody's watching, nobody's at home. I'm going to get on a computer. Right? Do y'all know what this is about to do? Preacher, you lost your mind. You admit that in front of seven, 800 people in church? Yep. You know why? Because the Lord's about to set me even more free of something. Amen. Amen? 
But about a decade, over a decade ago, I did struggle with that. And the only time I finally started overcoming it is when I started confessing it to a brother. I said, man, I need your prayer. You know what I found out immediately? He struggled with it too. And it gave him a breath of fresh air. He was like, crap, I ain't the only one. How many know you can be stuck in something, straight up bondage, and you can't seem to break free from it? You know you need to, you know you want to, and you can't break free from it. The Bible gives us instructions on how to break free from stuff. And one of the ways is I needed to be healed of something. And when I started confessing it to my brother, he started confessing it to me, and we started praying for each other. And then eventually we started praying and fasting for each other, and eventually we don't have the issue anymore. There's two ways that God will change you. He'll touch you or teach you. And sometimes, and I don't know why he does it. I don't, I'm not God. And I know that we're going to have a lot of questions being answered once we're up in glory. But I know that sometimes he just touches people and they don't struggle no more in that area. And then the brother or sister right next to them are struggling. Right? He'll touch one and then he'll teach another. That means he's going to show you the way. He's going to give you the map. And he's going to tell you how to get rid of it. You know the scripture that helped me? If your right eye offend thee, pluck it out. How many of you know that your eyes, when you're looking at that stuff, it's offensive? Amen. It does all kinds of medical and brain stuff too, by the way. If your right eye offend thee, pluck it out. How many of you think that Jesus is into self-mutilation? He don't mean pull your eyeball out your socket. But he says get rid of the very thing that's causing you to fall to that temptation. Amen. So if it's your phone, get rid of it for a season. You crazy? You can't live without a phone? Oh, yes, you can. There's people in here that's lived without them before. Amen. If it's your TV, get rid of your TV. If it's your laptop, get rid of your laptop. Whatever it is that's causing you to stumble, get rid of it. He touched one and set them free, but maybe he didn't touch you and set you free, but he's going to teach you how. You know what, it, you know what I believe why he'll teach some? It's because that's going to be a teacher. And you're going to need to know how the scriptures, some will just testify of God's power and he just set me free of it. And the other ones, he's going to teach you how to, whatever it is, whatever your flavor of sin is, he's going to teach you how to get overcome that. Why? Because he's going to have you teaching it to other people as you get older. Does that make sense? So one of the weights is sin. Another one is hindrances. I, had to, <laughs> I hated to admit this as a 43-year-old, but you all remember the, the message, Burn the Boats? Let me see if I say it right. Quirme los bargos. Any Spanish speakers in here? Burn the boats. One of my boats that I had to burn was playing games. Y'all want to come to church today? Minesweeper, I could play for six hours straight. Bejeweled, I'm done. And then especially when you get a big combo and it goes, woo. I'm like, yeah, I got this one. Next. <laughs> Dumb, ain't it? Pastor Dwayne pre preached a powerful message about time wasters. This is a time waster. How many of you know that I'd have got to church a lot faster, felt a lot better once I got here if I didn't have that in my backpack? A lot of us are going to show up in glory a lot tired than we should be because we're carrying junk that we don't need. All right, listen to this. This one really got me. Cares of the world. Worrying. Anybody in here? Worry, fears, anger. Okay, y'all listen to this. Everybody in here can have a long day. Everybody in here can have a bad day. Everybody in here can just have a rough day. How many of you know that if I'm talking to Patrick and Samantha and Patrick's starting to confess stuff to me, starting to tell me some stuff, I'm having a great day, right? I'm having a great day. And Patrick says, hey, preacher, can I, can I talk to you for five minutes? I'm like, yeah, man, what's up? He starts pouring out his heart. How many know when he starts pouring out his heart, he's giving me stuff? It's making him feel lighter and making me feel heavier. You want me to prove it? Have you ever been in the presence of somebody before you met them that morning, lunch, and afternoon, or night? You were fine. You were sincerely fine. And then after you got to talking to him for 15 minutes, now you not, you're not fine no more. You're just as scared as they are. You're just as mad as they are. You're just as worried as they are, right? It's because they're handing you stuff. And we need to learn how to do this. As he's handing it, this is what the Lord showed me. 
He starts to tell me stuff, whatever it is, fears, anxieties, anger. As he's telling it to me, he gives me one. Jesus. Jesus. I'm doing this in my mind and in my heart. As he's talking to me, I'm like, Lord, you take it. I have proven that I'm too emotionally immature to carry this. Because if I carry it, I'm going to start throwing them at people. I go talk to his bride. I have that one too, and I throw it. Do you know how I learned that? Learned that the hard way. Because you know why? Miss Molly, stand up. And this is not just ministers or pastors or evangelists or elders or team leaders or lay pastors or deacons. It doesn't matter. If you're a child of God, and especially around a lost person, this is what's happening. They don't realize it. Maybe you don't realize it. But they see the anointing of Christ in you. And the anointing of Christ in you are drawn to you, and then they'll start to talk to you. And as they start to talk to you, instead of casting all their cares upon Christ because they don't believe in him, they'll cast their cares upon you because they know you do. Powerful, isn't it? So I'd come home, and I'd be like, oh, man, I just want to go home, take a shower, eat a big old sandwich, and sit in my chair and do nothing. That's my plan, right? Because I'm tired. It's too heavy. And I'd come home, and my bride, praise God, for tough women, I'd come home, and I'd go, she's like, how's your day? I'd be like, fine. <laughs> and now she's going to get it, right? And tell me this is what we did. She would pick it up, and at the time, she didn't know what to do with it either. And then sometimes I'd come home, she already had too much, and we'd get to throwing them at each other. Right? That's called family violence, but guess what? That, that's called North Texas. Sometimes that's called normal. We don't know how to handle it. My people perish due to lack of knowledge because they have refused my word. God gave us a way that we could cast all our cares upon him. God gave us a way to lay aside every weight. So now we're learning. This household is learning how if we come home with burdens, get rid of them before you come in the house. Say, Lord Jesus, wash me clean so that when I come home, I get my, my wife and she gets me. Amen. Amen. No problems. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Said that one. Okay. I got a, a few more, but I think pretty sure y'all get the point. So if y'all, the Bible says, examine yourself, test yourself. Don't you know yourself if you're in the faith or not? Sometimes you just need to examine yourself to see if you have unnecessary weight going on. Sometimes it's unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is so powerful. So powerful. When we walk in forgiveness and unforgiveness, you are walking and messing with an eternal thing. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Many people, at least this, because I don't want to get into a whole other sermon. I, I think sometimes I wear people out. I'm not trying to wear you out, but I'm concerned. And I I've know I've walked in, in several years of torment because I didn't know what the Word of God said. I didn't know how to apply it to my life, even if I did know what it said. And, and it just is a big struggle. But unforgiveness, at the very minimum, if you have known unforgiveness in your emotions and in your heart, at the very minimum, say, Jesus, help me learn how to forgive. That's it. If you can't do it today... I'm not saying that's fine, but I'm saying don't make it black and white, right and wrong, up and down. It does, just make it to where you don't stop communicating with Jesus. You just say, Lord, teach me how to do it. One testimony of what God did to me is that every once in a while I knew that I had to just do an inventory because I can never preach from a foundation of bitterness and unforgiveness. I know that I always have to preach from a, a foundation of forgiveness and of love and of compassion and fire. Like fire shut up in your bones and you just want to get it out. Where there's no apprehension. You just say the word exactly how it is and there's nothing holding you back from certain people in the room or how they're looking at you or viewing you. And the Lord told me one time, he says, you need to forgive such and such. I said, I'm not doing it. And he, how many know that God will love you and he'll keep, he'll keep urging you to do it anyway? Amen. You need to forgive this person. I'm like, I'm not doing it. And he said, why? God, I'll ask you questions. And I... And I was like, because I'm so angry. They lied about me, and people believed it. Not only did they lie, they lied and they believed it. 
So now I'm walking in Brookshire's and people believe in lies. I'm like, well, they must have heard him too. Right now I'm getting to where I can't be around people. You see how unforgiveness will slowly start to trap you and suffocate you. And then finally he asked me again, you need to forgive this person. And I was like, how do I? Because this is my dilemma. I say I forgive them. I don't mean it. Now I'm a liar. Or I don't forgive them, and now I'm a disobedient child for not forgiving. Which one do you want, Lord? Which one's lesser? Anybody ever get caught in that dilemma? And I heard the Lord say this, The power of life and death is in the tongue. He who loves it will eat of its fruit. When you say it, it'll start speaking life into the situation. And I was like, okay, Lord, do you know my heart? You know, I really don't mean it, but I'm saying it out of obedience to you. And I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive, and I said their name. And something broke loose in my heart. It wasn't a big one, but something broke loose. And I was like, no, I could tell something happened. I choose to forgive this person. Something broke loose. And he says, you want to go a little further? I'm like, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I mean, that's good for me today. <laughs> he said, pray for him. I was like, Lord, I can't pray for him. He said, really, Jason? You can't pray for him? You ready for this? You're a pastor. He loves you enough to tell you the truth. I said, okay, Lord, what do I pray? He said, just pray, I'll bless them. I said, Lord, would you bless? And I believe names are powerful. Verbalizing things out loud is powerful. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. It has your salvation tied to it. I said, Lord, would you bless such and such? And in that moment, I saw this person as a little child getting beat by their daddy. And my, my unforgiveness was annihilated. Because he showed me the reason they behave that way is because that's how they were treated. And I'm not real big into the psychology thing and all that stuff, but it is true. Hurt people turn around and hurt people. People who got beat will turn around and start to beat. People who cursed and ridiculed will turn around and curse and ridicule. Amen. And it has to be. It has to be broken somewhere. There has to be a generation that is willing and brave enough to just submit to Christ and say, Lord, just teach me. And now, this is, because have you ever wondered, how do I know if I forgave them or not, right? How do you know that? Well, people that say this, I forgive, but I will not forget. You didn't forgive. Let me explain why. And I don't mean forget it totally like um, annihilated and removed from your remembrance. I mean the thought no longer bothers you. What did Jesus do when he forgave us of our sin? He cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. Amen. We don't walk as a sinner anymore. We walk as an ambassador of Christ. Amen. This is how I could tell now if I've forgiven somebody fully or if I still, there's like a lingering effect there. I'm okay. Let's say me and Patrick. Send it, buddy. Let's say me and Patrick had ways with each other two years ago. And I think I've forgiven him. And I see him, and my first thought is to go the other way. You ain't forgiven. The one who is forgiven is okay in the other person's presence. Doesn't mean you have to hang out and be buddy buddy anymore, but their presence no longer bothers you. Why? Because they owe you nothing. Because God has washed that from you. Amen. Amen. Now we have, a, we have an achievable goal that we can all ask Christ Jesus, Lord, help me through this. Amen. Does that help everybody a little bit more when it comes to the Department of Forgiveness? Amen. Speaking of that department, every one of us in here need to be forgiven. And you know, I, this is where I normally say, because you ain't getting to heaven if you don't. And that is a true statement. But the Lord is showing me something. Man. He said, he said it. It's red ink on white paper. He said it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is where I was messing up. I was saying a little prayer so that I could go to heaven and not burn in hell. Who wants to do that? Amen. But what I'm learning now is that we can walk. We can walk such a powerful, rich life here now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Everybody say on earth. On earth. 
as it is in heaven. First John says, if the truth live in you, then you should walk just as he walked, and that we are just like him in this world. The Bible says in First John, in this world. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to walk that out. I'm trying to see what that looks like, not only in my living room, but at Brookshire's or at Walmart or at the cell bar. And I'm trying to walk, walk this thing out because I believe that God doesn't want us just to say a little prayer so that we go to heaven. I want to see people start moving in miracles. I want to see people start being healed. I want to, see start, I want to start seeing God just make people go, wow. I've seen it across the big pond in Uganda. I want to start seeing it in North Texas. So I, I'm convinced that God didn't change just by crossing the Atlantic Ocean. He's just as powerful here. So we got to do something. There's something that's got to jostle loose that we see that God is powerful. You know this? Can we stand, please? Whew. Mm. Lord, what do we do? Ben, can you come, please? Mm. Thank you, Lord. My brother Jordan already showed us this today. Jordan, thank you for not being shy worshiping God. Thank you for not being shy praising Him and praying. You might make people feel uncomfortable at times, but you're also inspiring others, brother. I don't want any minister to come up here. If you do, I want you to stand on the sides and pray at a distance. But all I want you to do, if you feel led to come to the altar, you pray. And this is between you and Jesus. It's not between you and a minister, you and a church. This is between you and Jesus. So as the, as the band plays, and if you feel led, just come up to the altar. Sometimes you don't have to request anything. You don't have to say anything. Sometimes if you just got on your knees before the Lord, He will flush you clean. So as the band plays, you come. I'm going to turn off my mic. I'm going to stand off at the side. And let's just have this in altar time. Amen? Love y'all. Hear the Hello, everybody, again. Uh, you just finished listening to the sermon today. And uh, I have another scripture. Imagine that. Now, lots of God's Word being poured into you today or tonight or however, what time um, this message is reaching you. But in Mark chapter 4, verse 15, it talks about the parable of the sower. And the seed, God's seed, is God's Word. And listen to this real quick. It says, And these are the ones by the wayside where the Word is sown, when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in your hearts. So since God's word has been sown in your heart during that message, it is our prayer that God solidifies that seed and protects it and watches over it and may it be watered. And just as God's word says, may he give the increase. And I pray he gives the increase of salvation in your life. And I need you to hear this real quick. I need you to pause what you're doing. I need you to listen. And I pray these words sink deep down into your soul. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if you do, you do believe that to be true, then I pray that you, that you say this prayer. And you know what? You don't want to say it if you don't mean it. But, don't, but if you do believe it and you do mean it, then you need to confess it. You know, When, God, when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, it fills up your heart. And uh, you desire to be saved. So you just say a simple prayer like this. You say, Lord Jesus, I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. And I ask that you come into my life. And be the boss of my life. Today I confess you as Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Be Lord of my life. And if you did that, your salvation is um, totally and completely secured. And I would encourage you to go tell somebody that you got saved today or tonight or whenever you heard this message. And I pray we see you again back at the sermon section. I pray you come and visit us in person if, uh, 
um, if you're around this local area. But either way, may God bless you, and we love you all in Jesus' name. Bye-bye.